Hello, everyone, and welcome to the panel discussion on creating trust for cryptocurrencies. I'm John Lehman. I'm truly really honored to share this panel with amazing speakers, entrepreneurs, and academics. And Uh, and uh, other cryptocurrencies are, are following through. So, but are they investable? Can we trust them? What, what, what are the regulatory implications? So we'll be exploring today some of the challenges and opportunities that cryptocurrencies present and how the notion of trust is being redefined in this new paradigm. So I'd like to invite uh, Moon, Moon Jerin from the UCL Center of Blockchain Technologies uh, to kick off the conversation and Moon, um, I'd like to ask you, um, what is your perspective on the adoption of, of cryptocurrencies? What is driving adoption of cryptocurrencies? How do we make sense of which projects uh, and platforms we can trust? And what are regulatory implications of, uh, of uh, cryptocurrencies? So just a few questions. It would be great to get your perspective. Thank you, John. Um, thank you and good morning and good afternoon, everybody, whoever is watching here. It's a really great question. Um, why cryptocurrency is relevant? It is really about comes down to the and the decentralized the DLC currencies. And that question has to be coming through a context of different parts of the world where some people think that is it going to be here to disrupt the financial industry that has been, that has been already built? I would be really careful to say it's not, you know, when we use the word disrupt, then it becomes more riskier than saying adoption in different parts of the world. As an example, some countries, central banking system is not something that their citizen trust, such as Venezuela. As an example, if Venezuelan people were to able to like invest their savings into Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency that they can trust, then their money wouldn't be devalued, even though cryptocurrencies can be speculative at times. However, you know, it is better than in a system where your people are not being able to trust the government. Therefore, I think this trust in cryptocurrency really comes in situations like different parts of the world, how the citizens of the specific countries are really looking at their banking system and how much they trust um, the currency and you know, how this is going to be used in different places. Can you repeat the second part of your question, John? Different projects, I remember now. Yeah, so, so the second part would be around the, the regulatory perspective that drives the precisely fosters this trust in, in the asset class. So that definitely is related to the type of project that it can go to. I still believe that cryptocurrencies and blockchains are still at a very infancy stage of where it can potentially go to. In terms of that, in, in talking from a very, um, I would say, conservative point of view, there, the three things that comes to my mind is financial industries, the healthcare and supply chain. This is the top three things where there is really practical use cases. However, where they can be truly successful is the mass adaptation, you know, and that's, that mass adaptation takes time, which is ultimately the biggest challenge. And in terms of regulation in the, I would give the example of the United States is that regulation has to come to SEC, through SEC, and SEC has basically their points of, you know, if something is not, Centralized, SEC can't really regulate that. However, looking at the current trend of Bitcoin, you know, hitting that $1 trillion market cap, China having its own digital currency, I do believe we're not too far away for having some sort of a regulations coming through. But, you know, I think the point is that if you're trying to regulate cryptocurrency, which is built on the decentralized model, there is going to be a situation where some people are going to not accept some of those coins who are going to be under the regulation. Um, if any of the people here remember what happened to that um, DAO hack with Ethereum, you know, where they called for the fork and then some of the early adopters felt that the fact that they created the fork, it made, um, it broke the promise of making Ethereum immutable. Therefore, they stuck with the one 
that was before that the Ethereum Classic and after that is currently we call it just a simple, simply like Ethereum platform. Therefore, it all comes down to different types of users that are on the platform. And what makes me happy today is that we currently live in a world where we actually have choices. And I think that's the whole point of having digital currency, having different types of cryptocurrency, that 7 billion people, not all of us are going to want the same thing. Not all of us, our needs are not the same. Therefore, we have different types of currencies and system in places where some people need regulated, more regulation, they can go with coins that are more compatible with that, where some people, they do not need that. And I think it is a good way to have options for them. So I really think we are moving towards the time where we're going to be always coexisting in a world where there's going to be always something for someone to choose from. Right. Uh, th th thank you. That's very, very insightful. And the diversity element um, in, is, is essential to the driving adoption. And one of the questions we, which are often, um, which is really a bit of a conundrum and kind of a puzzle in terms of uh, the relationship between trust and transparency, I'd like to ask Rob his, uh, his thought around that. So uh, how do we actually redefine trust in a decentralized world? And what is the relationship uh, between trust and transparency? Is transparency a prerequisite to trust? And how do we reconcile transparency, trust, and confidentiality to drive precisely more adoption and, and uh, address some of those contradictions or, or paradoxes that, that are maybe apparent in this uh, distributed world? This is a really philosophical area. You know, the, the, the nature of trust, the nature Hello, of Alex. truth. Um, the nature of proof. Um, I I think that um, trust comes from outcomes, in my view. Um, that if you are able to generate uh, outcomes that are certain all the time, that is what leads to trust ultimately um, happening. And you know, in the blockchain world, what we're able to do um, through, you know, cryptographic means, through through very established mathematical proofs, um, is to deliver that certainty that leads to very, very consistent outcomes. And that is what creates trust. Now, do I care what, what happens in the middle uh, in terms of all of the detail and all of the necessary stuff that happens, you know, within the plumbing of the, of the ecosystem? I don't care. I just want to know my transaction has completed in the time frame, you know, with the right amount that everybody's got what they need to get. Um, and there's a hundred percent success every single time. Um, I, I don't need the detail. I don't necessarily need the transparency either. I think one of the things, you know, I've had this conversation a number of times with people is, is, is about trust. It's actually in the blockchain space about zero trust. Trust is something that you need when you sort of are praying and hoping that something is going to happen because I don't have visibility or certainty around an outcome. So I'm, I'm going to take a leap, which is a leap of trust, that it is going to happen, but I'm not 100% sure that it is going to happen. So if you can take that away and replace all of that with proofs that everything will happen exactly as the way you intend it to, um, you actually create an environment where certainty of outcomes. Um, you know, when you buy something from somebody, just for argument's sake, in, in China or Russia, are you 100% sure that you're going to get what you've ordered? Are you 100% sure that the person is going to get paid the amount that you've um, um, authorized for them to, to be paid? And I think this is one of the things that um, cryptocurrencies potentially are going to change uh, in terms of the ability to deliver 100% certain outcomes. Um, uh, and, and that is going to be transformative, I think, for commerce generally. <clears throat> I, Thank I, you, Rob. That's very insightful. And uh, um, the, the zero trust paradigm is, is essential to, to cybersecurity. I mean, the never trust always veri uh, verify where, where we kind of uh, look at this shift from uh, a, a perimeter or like uh, depending on mode to actually 
focusing on the user and the identity uh, with access controls policies and check policies. So, um, so yeah, so, so Lance, uh, actually you, you were uh, going to, to jump in and uh, could you tell us uh, more about the blockchain intelligence group? I mean, there's a perception that grid current cryptocurrencies are mainly used by uh, hackers and its purposes. Uh, some people think that, but in, in reality, it's, uh, it's, 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 nothing, it's, it's quite far from the truth. And it's, um, and so how do, 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 does the, the blockchain intelligence group um, address this, uh, this question and how do you actually contribute to create more trust and adoption in, in cryptocurrencies and in, in, in digital assets? Sure. Thank you, Gene. Well, I have to admit, you know, in the early days, <clears throat> excuse me, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, uh, there was a higher percentage of transactions that were being used for illicit purposes. Um, and, and this is true as nefarious actors are always trying to find creative ways to, to accomplish their end goals. Um, but now that cryptocurrency is over a decade old, other cryptocurrencies and other markets have spawned, making things a little bit more challenging for companies like ours, such as Dash, Zcash, Monero. Um, but I think that the on-ramps for those are going to become less and less as regulation uh, increases in different areas. And obviously, if the on-ramps become less, the liquidity becomes less, and uh, it forces them to to kind of have to even be more creative. But so our company provides attribution to addresses through uh, the different chains that we support. Uh, we have surface web crawlers, dark web crawlers, uh, and open source intelligence teams looking for uh, <clears throat> addresses and flagging them with different types of attribution. So uh, examples would be if we saw an address on the dark web um, being used to exploit children. Uh, we would then ch uh, tag it with child exploitation. Or if we saw a, a terrorism donation address uh, in a YouTube video, or if we've identified, <clears throat> excuse me, an address that has uh, been sanctioned, uh, we would apply those types of attribution to those addresses. So Blockchain Intelligence Group essentially is a data gathering and analytics company. And, and our mission from day one has been to bring cryptocurrencies mainstream. And we meet this objective by offering tools to law enforcement to allow them to track the flow of funds uh, and identify the choke points where KYC or, or know your client information has been uh, collected and therefore allow law enforcement to de-anonymize, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> these pseudo-anonymous people. And uh, another example would be identifying that a source of funds came from a, a mixing service or, or funds were sent to the dark market to buy drugs. And so our strategy has been a, a three-pronged approach, provide tools to law enforcement to visually track the flow of funds and create the evidence that would be necessary to allow a judge to follow the money um, with, without understanding how crypto works. Um, you know, and secondly, is to educate regulators on what's possible from a tracking perspective and in turn help them shape regulations uh, in this uh, and for this new financial era. And <clears throat> I'd say thirdly, uh, providing finance organizations uh, that want to accept crypto um, the ability to determine if their funds meet their AML thresholds. And we do this providing uh, a risk score for addresses and transactions. Kind of think of it like a, uh, a credit score, but instead a risk score. And uh, <clears throat> that includes all of the flagging and attribution that we know about that address uh, or the addresses involved. And so through these collective services, it, it, it furthers the adoption and, and, and creates more trust on all levels uh, of, of the actors that are involved in this in this ecosystem, and um, and we feel through that it will get greater awareness and easier on ramps and and getting to the point now where your taxi driver and your grandmother know how to be able to go and buy crypto and and so that's what we do as a company and what our goals are. Thank you, Lance. It's very insightful. Indeed, like the adoption, ease of use, user friendliness, and it is essential to to foster and contribute to adoption. And it, it, for many, I mean, it's still quite um, quite um, quite opaque as a as a um, as an asset class. And uh, we're only seeing the the, the beginning of, of the adoption from institutional investors. Uh, I can see Alex with um, um, Alex Mashinsky, so we're truly honored to have uh, with us Alex Mashinsky, who is the CEO of Celsius Networks. Uh, Alex, uh, you're a serial entrepreneur. You were one of the inventors of uh, an early developer voice of uh, IP, and you created Celsius Networks, uh, a cryptocurrency marketplace, an ecosystem 
um, a, a borrowing and lending platform uh, for cryptocurrencies that is built on, on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, it has a market cap of about uh, $1 billion mark and a large community of users. So it would be great to, to hear from you. And uh, what, what, is the, what, what is the vision behind Celsius networks? And how do you create, do you create and maintain trust in a community of more than 450,000 users? So, yeah, we, 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 we would be uh, very interested in, in getting your perspective of how you grew this community and how do you actually create, maintain, and, and, and foster trust within this ecosystem. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Sorry for being a little bit late. Um, so uh, the concept behind Celsius was all about uh, creating a financial institution that always focuses on the customer. I mean... I thought I know it's kind of sound cliche and, and sounds for gr for granted, but uh, unfortunately, um, most financial institutions today have such high pressure to deliver earnings and deliver returns to the shareholders that they completely forgot about their customers. Um, so, if you look at traditional banks like J.P. Morgan, for example, uh, they had their best quarter ever uh, last quarter, sixteen billion in profit. Uh, and yet they're paying basically zero in, in interest to their customer, to their depositors. And, and that's something that they elect to do, right? They basically elect to give all the profits to the shareholders, where with Celsius, we focused on delivering 80% of our revenues to the customers, to the depositors. So by creating this new organization that, that really is focused on uh, the consumer is uh, leveraging cryptocurrencies, leveraging the blockchain, open ledger. Um, you know, we just crossed 11 billion in assets. Uh, last year, at the same time, we had less than $500 million in assets. So, so the growth has been phenomenal. Um, and again, it's not that we're so great. It's that the, the banks are just not doing the job they're supposed to be doing for their customers. So... Today, um, yields at Celsius uh, on U.S. dollars are over 10%. That is 100 times more, 100 times higher than what the average J the J.P. Morgan pays their customers. It's not 10 times higher. It's 100 times higher. Yeah. So you have to ask yourself, um, how is that possible uh, in an environment where basically, again, everybody's starving for yield? Um, um, and, and what happens to all that capital? If this continues the way it is, what happens to all the capital? Does it stay in the financial system or does it migrate to platforms like Celsius? Thank you, Alex. It's a great uh, and very insightful perspective. It's, a, um, it's an interesting segue into the financial uh, applications of blockchain cryptocurrencies. And I actually referred... Uh, uh, like new initiatives from central banks, central bank digital currencies. Um, we, we actually do work with uh, Consensus, which has some uh, pilot projects with uh, a few central banks around the world. China has all, also developed um, you know, many innovations patterns. So it's, it's kind of the, the roadmap of uh, central banks. And uh, there's been a gradual erosion of trust since the financial crisis. So, so how, I'd like to ask the, the, the question to Stephen, the, the CEO of Manage Pro. Um, if you give your perspective on, on central bank digital currencies and how um, blockchain, cryptocurrencies can create a, 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 possibly a better perspective or a better, a an opportunity to reinvent infrastructure for financial services. Well, the, the central bank one, I think, is, is pretty easy. Yeah, the central bank one, I think, is pretty easy. I think people confuse the nature of it. If I want to send, you know, five thousand or ten or fifty thousand dollars to to Alex, I have to wire transfer. If I want to do it with a digital token, I can email it to him. So <laughs> in essence, a lot of what the central bank digital notes are gonna be is just a digital movement of money through the network. It's it's not more complicated than that. I'm gonna have money in a Wells Fargo account. I'll transfer it down to a digital Wells Fargo token, probably a ripple send it across the network to somebody at Chase, it'll convert to a Chase token. And then if they need fiat, it'll convert back up to fiat. So the, the 
I think the biggest reason banks want central notes and digital is they want to control the cash flow. Just like, you know, Alex was saying is if you can control cash, you can no longer circumvent the system. And so the banks are a lot about how do you create a new settlement platform? What, what we did at Mineta Pro is the exact opposite. We built a, a closed system. Companies list goods, sell them, get an internal credit. We created our own internal global currency that has financial settlement inside our own network. But for banks, banks just want settlement. It's, it's fascinating. If I wire transfer a million dollars to somebody in China or Bulgaria, it's still moving digital money. But the old network has a million dollars sitting in different stops along the way. And again, back to Alex's point, I love Celsius. The banks make money on the interest. My million dollars is sitting in different stops along the way. And the banks and everybody in the ACH SWIFT network make money. Digital tokens and settlements will take that out. That money will transfer and clear in 20 minutes. So there's going to be all kinds of new systems that, that are being created. It's PayPal 2.0. How do you create new settlement? How do you create new payment? And the trust within the network, I, I, I look at it a little differently in closing. We've had three public companies in the micro cap space, the, the, the small cap. The transparency wasn't there because every time you do a public company, the company can issue more stock. They can create more liquidity. They can do a lot of things that, that aren't transparent to traditional small cap stockholders. By the time you get up to New York Stock Exchange, everything's bigger. But that penny stock, micro cap, that's the highly volatile. That's the speculative retail market. That's where most of the crypto tokens are. Most, most crypto are, in my opinion, they're glorified penny stocks. They're very speculative, very risky. You buy a 10 cent stock, not because you own equity, you buy a 10 cent stock, hoping it goes to a dollar. And then you lament not buying a Celsius token at three cents and watching it go to $5. So that that's where I think crypto tokens to me are, are a much more volatile aspect, but the, the transparency of being able to see how many tokens are issued, who owns them, it forces the companies to be more legitimate, which ultimately protects the token holder or shareholder, depending on how you look at it. If I can add to that, um, the, it's really a race between three different uh, solutions. So the digital yuan or the digital dollar or all um, central bank uh, digital currencies are, uh, they're not limited supply, meaning they're not really replacing the idea that, okay, a central bank can print as much money as they want. Uh, China's directive, specific directive, is that they want to not just deliver that money directly to the people they want to deliver it to, a certain sec section of the population, but also direct the use, meaning that they'll say, okay, this can only be used in retail uh, consumption. You cannot put it in the stock market. You cannot do it. And with digital currency, you can do that. Uh, the second solution is more like the corporate solution. So if you're looking at the J.P. Morgan uh, token, which they use for settlement, internal settlement with all of their counterparties, uh, or Libra, which used to be called Libra, right? The Facebook version. So that there's a corporate version competing with the CBDCs. And then you have the open standard uh, Bitcoin-like or Ethereum-like system. So you have three horses really yeah. competing for the standard. The big difference between Bitcoin and all the others is that it's the only one that has limited supply, right? And, and it has clear you know, uh, a supply that cannot be manipulated, like St as Stephen was saying. Um, and, and that's why it's appreciated so much in value, right? It's the best performing asset anywhere in the world in the last 12 years, Bitcoin, right? So, so I think um, the question is really what are people, consumers and corporations are going to choose? Are they going to choose the corporate version? Are they going to choose the government version? Or are they going to choose the limited supply version? That's super interesting. And it raises the question of standards and policy and governance frameworks. But, but they're also and, just real, real quick, and I'll let you move on again. And I, I think Alex and I are in agreement on this. The industry has done a disservice of calling everything cryptocurrencies because they're not all designed to act as currencies. The blockchain performs different functions 
for different assets, whether it's a token or a Bitcoin or a Celsius unit, they're different functions on an underlying technology. They're not all competing to do the same thing. So they can't all be called the same thing. There is a, there is right. a simple, so, very, so, but actually I want to ask you the next question to you. So yeah. standards, policy, governance, um, what do you think, um, which policies should the private and public sectors adopt for cryptocurrencies to be more widely adopted and trusted? Said around precisely uh, this element of trust and, and, and diversity and, uh, and prevalence and which model is going to be adopted because essentially this is also a policy question in addition to it being a, a technology question. Um, uh, look, uh, there is nothing bad in monistic money. Uh, I have started as a trader in 1993 uh, and I was able to observe the, uh, the change of financial system uh, through the technological development and uh, through the technological breakthroughs, we have started to experience the notion of money differently. And uh, as a natural way uh, 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 appear at uh, cryptocurrencies. So uh, the, the users of uh, cryptocurrencies, there are a uh, few types, say there are uh, libertarian communists who just hate monistic money, hate uh, say Jewish guys, uh, central bankers, uh, private banks, and etc. There are pure technologists who are just uh, trying to uh, make uh, P2P models for the good of people who are uh, equipped with uh, handy computers, uh, uh, etc. And also there are uh, uh, gangsters. So I would say uh, there is nothing bad in coexisting of monistic money and cryptocurrencies. But in the future, we we would burst the financial uh, system as a such if everybody will start to create more and more money supply through the cryptocurrencies. And uh, such an unregulated process might be very dangerous for all of us, including for the investors in, uh, say, in bitcoins, because you cannot uh, push it... Uh, uh, all the time uh, up to the sky because finally behind uh, the cryptocurrencies uh, there is nothing else as a mathematical solution. There is no inner imminent uh, 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 value but it's not enough. This is enough just for a barter blockchain exchanging of different goods or uh, 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 solutions, but it's not something else than 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 the uh, uh, monistic money. So it should be regulated. It requires a regulation. You're on mute, John. I cannot hear nothing. Oh, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. now, yeah. Okay, there was, um, okay. So, actually, um, we, we discussed about this notion of, uh, you know, regulation and confidentiality and distributed trust. So, these are on relatively general terms. And, uh, Rob, you, you, you've developed a... Um, you know, a very interesting model around celibacy to apply zero knowledge proof uh, in, 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 in particular uh, banking applications and uh, identity and access management. So, and, and that's a framework where we actually we, we can share information and this does us a, well, without actually revealing the entirety of the information. So, it's besides your problem. Sorry to interrupt you. I think uh, our audiences cannot hear us. So, they are, I think, writing a couple of messages. Okay. I think they can't hear. Yeah. So uh, that's I, I'm not sure it's uh, under my control. I don't know what, what I can do to, to that because uh, um, as um, yeah. So, so um, I think that may have been. So yes, we, 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 
We can hear you, so yeah, that's okay. if we okay. can hear you, they so, should be yeah. able to hear you. Uh, okay, good, good. So, Rob, I, I, I want to ask you, so can you give a perspective on how zero knowledge proof is applied and what's the, the application to cryptocurrencies when you actually is, when there's actually limited trust between participants? So, I, I agree with Boyan. I, I don't think um, that it's up for question that regulation is going to happen in, in the crypto and digital world. It is a certainty. It is going to happen. Um, the degree to which it happens is uh, where there may be some um, question, and that will be distributed across the world in terms of how restrictive or, or tight it's going to be. Now, one of the things that um, we've been spending a lot of time on is how you can um, regulate um, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, digital assets generally, but still allow individuals who are participating or organizations who are participating to maintain privacy and confidentiality. Um, because that's one of the sort of core tenets of the banking system today. The banks know who you are, but they keep your information very private, very confidential. We don't want to expose that in, um, in the digital um, asset crypto world. So the use of zero knowledge proofs and other things like multi-party computations um, allow you to um, communicate um, certainty around actors that they've complied with certain regulations without necessarily having to communicate everything you know about that individual. So I could let you join a club, for example, and say just by virtue of the fact that I've, I've let you join this club, um, I'm able to say you're you're fully trusted because we verified your identity. We know where you live. Uh, you know you're not you're not a pep. You're not sanctioned. You know you comply with all of the necessary things um, in order to get into the club. That in and of itself is valuable um, to, pr to preserve your your identity, your integrity, and keep your privacy and confidentiality as you transact within the network. The challenge comes, I think, as to when governments want to know who are actors within an ecosystem, who provides the assurance that uh, you are who you say you are or you are uh, authorized to act? And this is where I think what we call uh, trusted authorities are going to come uh, very much into play. These will be government agencies. Um, they, they could be utilities. Uh, they could be banks. They could be telcos. It could be a variety of different organizations but they will be highly trusted. We actually think where this is going to go is a combination of these organizations in a distributed fashion will be able to um, reconstruct who you are um, if and when a transaction needs to be inspected from, from um, a legal or a regulatory um, requirement. So if, uh, and I think it was Stephen was saying, you know, if a court or, or Lance maybe, um, if a court somewhere says uh, we suspect there's something going on here, we're going to give law enforcement the rights to, to inspect the transaction. It will be possible to reconstruct the identity of that individual um, from a variety of different sources. None of them have all of the information necessary to do it, but in, in collusion together, uh, in, in collaboration, they will be able to do it and provide that information to the authorities. And in so doing, You've created this world where, under normal circumstances, you've got full privacy, full confidentiality of the transactions, but only where a threshold of suspicion or identity information. And this is where, you know, the advanced cryptography that we're working on, zero knowledge proofs, multi-party computations can come in to automate these processes so that under normal circumstances, everything's fine. You're completely private and confidential. But when you've crossed that line where there's a suspicion, we can we can do more uh, to identify who you are. Yeah, that, that's great. Uh, thanks, Rob. It's an amazing perspective. So we have 10 minutes left. So, so I'd like to ask uh, each one of you, um, uh, and, and perhaps uh, start with Moon, uh, if you could tell us 
uh, what is what do you think is missing in the industry, and what do you see? What, what's your outlook for the industry going forward? And what 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 what, what would you like to see uh, as a uh, whether it's uh, like uh, new initiatives or new uh, new uh, new types of innovations and or so so what what do you think is missing in the industry to precisely um, um, create whether it's on the trust side of things or whether it's on the technology or whether it's on the regulation uh, would be so. Yes, yeah, so uh, a word of wisdom to, uh, to, to end the, the panel discussion. So, Moon, if you'd like to start. Thank you. That's a really great question, John. Um, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is very relevant to the topic of our conversation today is that what's missing is that trust. And that trust factor is what's really missing. But why? Is it missing is what we, I think, we're here to um, explore. I think, as Rob also said, you know, it's one of those situations where I think this dilemma is going to, to exist. As he said at some point, that it's about zero trust, but then it's also about trust, you know, um, that nothing is so far absolute. Is that, you know, I still talk to a lot of people where they might be in, the, in, the, in a position of, you know, a place where they're the one who might be making such decisions in the financial industry or where, whether or not to adopt blockchain or cryptocurrency or understand it, but they still don't take the time to actually understand what it is. So I think the biggest thing that's really missing is having a very clear understanding, having the knowledge, having the education, because if we do not take the time to you know, train our own mind to be more open-minded instead of right away saying, I trust this or I don't trust it, or, well, this is speculative, this is for you know illicit money laundering and blah, blah, blah. I think what happens is not only the fact that we miss opportunities, but we're also giving disadvantage to a lot of people who might be relying on not only our expertise, but also the decisions that we are making. So I think that is one of the biggest things that's missing. Where I see this is going and uh, what can be coming forward, I do believe that there can be a platform of education, you know, and I think that is something that's very relevant to what Alex is trying to do through Celsius Network. I mean, that's what I really call about democratizations, you know, and I think and a platform like that where we can even top it up with an educating people, you know, educating young people, educating older people. I think um, cryptocurrency and blockchain can only succeed when there's a mass adaptation. And that can only come from having proper awareness, understanding the risk, and also understanding the value. And the risk can only be, you know, going down the, the tipping point once you understand it and know exactly how to use it and become aware of that. So I really see that's exactly where it's going. And as time moves on, the brand new generation that's coming up, I think they are definitely ahead of the time and the way they started to use things for the social good. I, I do see, you know, I'm, an, I'm an a hopeless optimist that um, the cryptocurrency by the fact of understanding this, people are going to become much more aware of what their rights are, the type of world that they would like to live into, to be able to question the centralized authority, to be able to question what no longer works for us. And then it start to move into a new system, a new paradigm where we, um, together co-create a system that not only works for this generation but also much you know the future generation that's to come to and ultimately you know yeah. our fantastic man uh steven Jean. yeah my mine is simple we need more good projects that are successful that are returning value back to the token holders in the community and successful projects and i need alex to get approved in california so i can use his system <laughs> Uh, Alex, it's your turn. Well, uh, look, uh, with Voice of IP, you mentioned Voice of IP, we, we effectively took the power from the phone companies and gave it to the people. And today, right now, we're using VoIP for free without paying $3 a minute to AT&T or somebody else. So the same process is now happening 
with uh, uh, giving power for financial services back to the people. So this is not anything different. And again, what's happening with cryptocurrencies is the result of central banks abusing their power, printing money continuously, diluting our currency, debasing our currency. Uh, and and again, what I wish for is is more power to the people, right? So so if we can uh, deliver that capability in a safe and consistent way, uh, then everybody wins because after all, our government or our institutions are here to serve us, not the other way around. So so they abuse the power. We're now taking it back, and um, you know I think ten or twenty years from now, when people look at uh, the fact that we can transact with each other on our devices without any intermediaries, uh, they're going to be like, just like my kids. They say, what? Phones used to have a cord or you used to uh, have to press numbers. I just click on somebody's image, right? So the same way I think uh, managing money or transferring money is going to be managed uh, through cryptocurrencies and limited supply. Hey, okay. John, may I? John, you're muted. Uh huh. Boy, and I say go ahead because we're almost. Yep, go for it. <laughs> okay, so look, uh, uh, what I'm super confident uh, right now is that when we are giving more and more powerful tools and more complicated and sophisticated tools to the people to trade, it's causing the cognitive decline of, of the people across the world. And additionally, uh, what is really missing, uh, as, as per my point of view, is philosophical understanding of development of money. That is why uh, two years ago I, I published a post-money theory. I'm trying to explain and to prove that the money notion, the money experiencing as a uh, 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 as a phenomena is is uh, absolutely changing because of the societal change changes and technological changes. But it doesn't mean that we have to put the whole power uh, in just uh, in a second of click uh, to everybody. Uh, they to make not just uh, irrational decisions, but absolutely stupid decisions because right now we are not going about. We are not talking about the irrational people. We are talking about the stupid people who are equipped with the atomic bomb uh, in just one click of a, uh, a, a time to, to buy anything. And this is dangerous and this is dangerous for their financial health. Uh, I guess for my ad addition, I, I write to, to both Moon and to Stephen, um, education right, I think you. has been key. Right. And Lance and, and Rob. Education is key, and um, and also finding better projects, projects that will help advance this this ecosystem with real substance that uh, further creates confidence for everyone that, that this isn't just a pump and dump new sector. Um, and of course, people have to do their research uh, and, and make sure that they know who they're getting involved with, what the white paper is, what the capabilities of that aspect of the technology and blockchain and how it's being used. Um, but the more that people are educated, the more people are going to understand and feel comfortable and then get involved. So thank you. So, so in 10 seconds, I think you're going to see increased regulation, um, technology driving yes. increased uh, capability around privacy and confidentiality. And that ultimately is going to make it easier for people to consume. They don't want to hear about blockchain. They just want to hear that I can move money really cheaply and easily. Yep. Well said. That's that's my joke in closing. Okay, there fantastic, is no guys. It's been an amazing company. talk. So, uh, yeah. If anybody says you're a blockchain company, they, right. they don't know what they're talking about. It's like saying you're an internet company because right. you have a website. Right. <laughs> okay, so uh, so let's... Uh, so let's... Uh, fantastic. So, guys, thank you so much for such an amazing talk, and uh, we look forward to uh, more more to learn more from, from each and every of your companies and the, the great progress that you're making. So thank you, guys, and thank you to the audience as well. Um, thank you so much, John. So, thanks, John. Thank thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Stay healthy. Bye. Stay fit. Bye-bye.
Bye. Take care, everyone.